today, since we're doing a dialogic keynote, I have the honor of introducing two people who really need no introduction to this group, um, but I'm going to do it anyway. So Stephen Friedson is, un is University Distinguished Research Professor of Music and Anthropology at the University of North Texas. For the past 35 years, he has been conducting comparative research on music and ritual in Africa. His initial work in northern Malawi, under the auspices of a Fulbright Hayes Fellowship, takes a phenomenological approach to musical experience in traditional diagnostics and therapeutics. This was followed by a long-term research project in the Volta region of Ghana, uh, studying one of the dominant ritual sites on the southern coast, a medicine shrine whose origins lie in the northern region of the country. He is author of Dancing Prophets, Musical Experience in Tumbuka Healing, uh, published by University of Chicago Press, uh, and The Remains of Ritual, Northern Gods in a Southern Land, uh, winner of the Alan P. Merriam Prize for Outstanding Book in Ethnomusicology. He was the first ethnomusicologist to be named a fellow of the American Philosophical Society and received a national endowment for the Humanities Fellowship to finish the final book of a planned trilogy on African music and ritual. In addition to his work in Africa, he has several publications on the weaponization of music in the global war on terror. In a previous life, he played keyboards in the 1960s rock band The Kingsman, uh, gold record Louis Louis. So that is uh, Dr. Stephen Friedson. Uh, J. Lauren Matori is the Lawrence Richardson Distinguished Professor of Cultural Anthropology and the Director of the Sacred Arts of the Black Atlantic Project at Duke University. Professor Matori has conducted four decades of intensive research on the great region, the great religions of the Black Atlantic, West African Yoruba religion, West Central African Congo religion, Brazilian Candomblé, Cuban Santeria Osha, and Haitian Vodou, as well as their implications for Western social theory. He's also the executive producer, creative producer, or screenwriter of five documentary films. His book, Sex and the Empire That Is No More, Gender and the Politics of Metaphor in Oyo Yoruba Religion, was a Choice Magazine Outstanding Book of the Year, and his Black Atlantic Religion, Tradition, Transnationalism, and Matriarchy in the Afro-Brazilian Candomblé won the Herskovitz Prize from the African Studies Association. Professor Matori was also selected to deliver anthropology's most prestigious annual address, the Lewis Henry Morgan Lecture, which resulted in the book Stigma and Culture, Last Place Anxiety in Black America. His latest book, The Fetish Revise, Marx, Freud, and the Gods Black People Make, won the American Academy of Religion's prize for excellence in the study of religion for the analytical descriptive studies, the senior book prize for the American Eth Ethnological Society, and the J.I. Staley Prize of the School for Advanced Research. His next book is titled Slavery in the Heart of Freedom, Race, Religion, and Politics Through the Lens of BDSM. From 2003 to 2011, he served on the Presidential Advisory Committee on Cultural Property at the US Department of State. He's also received the Distinguished Africanist Award from the American Anthropological Association and the Alexander von Humboldt Prize, one of Europe's highest academic distinctions. So we are going to hear from both of our speakers and then we're going to get to engage with them in conversation um, and then we'll open up to Q&A. So please welcome these distinguished speakers. Thank you, thank you. It's great being here. And first, I want to commend the Institute of Sacred Music for spreading their proverbial wings and sponsoring this a series of conferences on the black sacred arts, particularly this one, Ritual Transformations of Consciousness, something I've been researching for, oh my god, 35 years. That was before my previous, after my previous life in the Kingsman, you know, playing Louis Louis every night. That's a, a whole different story. You know, my students used to know about the Kingsman, and then I used to get, oh yeah, my grandfather remembered that group. And, and I go, what group? What? Anyway, 
So today, our dialogic keynote, the drum and the AR-15, two icons, two indices in Peirce's sense of the term, pointing to soundscapes that are at opposite ends of the spectrum. One is life-affirming, in an African context, bringing music into being. The other is life-denying, unfortunately, in an American context, a soundscape of terror that silences all around it. She's had some really interesting conversations around this over the past month. What the hell does an AR-15 have to do with ritual transformations of consciousness? I think today we're going to refract these two ends of the spectrum and bring a new perspective on both these states of consciousness, if I can put it that way. And this has resonated with my own recent work on the weaponization of music. I've been interested in my career in intense musical experiences, music on the edge, at the limit, hence my work with ritual transformations of consciousness. But I also have found these experiences of music on the edge and something that began in the 21st century in the global war and terror, and that's the weaponization of music, specifically music torture. I want to bring these two close together to rub against each other, to refract off each other in kind of a ring dance. One is an ontological inversion of the other. But before I begin, let me begin in an African way and invoke an ancestor, one of the great scholars of the Black Atlantic who recently passed away, Robert Ferris Thompson, and one of the all-time great, thank you, Professor, for pouring that libation, one of the great podium drummers. He was known for that. I saw him when he got back from working with the Mbuti in the Anturi Forest, and it was amazing. The guy was just simply amazing and had a big effect on me. His whole thing about offbeat patterning of Awe Kente cloth and offbeat rhythms uh, really resonated. So may yours be of the cool sunset, as we say in Ghana. The terminology that I'm using here, I can't, you won't get it from me speaking because it's hyphenated. Being in the world, being there, being away, being with, being musical. Those hyphens are ontological. They have ontological import. So when you hear these terms, think hyphen. These things are not two separate things, but together. My initial work in Malawi really uh, speaks to much of the conversation we were having yesterday around different ritual transformations of consciousness. We know, of course, that there's a multiplicity of these. There's not one way of being. And the discussion was about how much people are aware, is it totally amnesic, et cetera. And this hooks in to much of my comparative work in Ghana and in Malawi. So in Malawi, the dancing prophets I worked with have a kind of consciousness doubling. They develop, that matures. They go, it's like the ripening of a fruit. When they first are afflicted with the disease of the prophet and these foreign Vimbuza spirits come in and overheat, the only way to get better is to, what they say, is to dance your disease. It cools down the spirits. If you're going to become a prophet healer, it will push up the ancestral spirits inside of you to allow for divination. So this particular configuration of spiritual energy is an ontology of musical energy. The Vimbuza spirits, what they say is the drums, are the battery for the spirits. It heats them up and fuels the divination trance. They speak in technological terms about their practices. 
music is a battery. The first time I ever saw a healer dance, I turned to the guy next to me and I go, what's he doing? He's going, oh, he's x-raying the patients. So there is this explicit medical technology going on around music, something we don't have. I'm going to show a very brief clip of the healer Mula Ula, which means speaker of hidden things. He was one of the most famous healers when I was working in Malawi. People from all over southeastern Africa would come to his Chipatala, his hospital, to be diagnosed about their ills and misfortune. This scene is about 3 o'clock in the morning. He's wearing white maize flower, uh, which is symbolic of the ancestors. You're going to see a rosary across. He's Christian, but syncretized, that old term, with uh, traditional beliefs. And he's heating up the spirits. He says that when the drums sound, he feels their wind enter his legs up into his heart. healing purposes. Okay. Uh, this is a consciousness doubling. He's there and he's not there at the same time. Very different than the shrines I worked with in West Africa. This is uh, Gorovodu, which in Hausa means, Goro means kolonet. It's a kolonet shrine. These gods came from northern Ghana down into the south into the 1920s and became really part of the black Atlantic religion of Vodou or Goro Vodou. And when the gods come, someone must be away. This is Kunde, the father, always dressed in red, the hunter. His wife, Ablawa, always dressed in white, who can intercede with Kunde, but also is one of the most fearsome deities. You break a taboo, she brings retribution against you. Here, people are totally away when the gods can only be there when someone is away, as attested to by this testimony of a tronchi, a wife of the gods. This is Choria. The, uh, this is one of the, they ride their mounts, this uh, widespread metaphor of divine horsemen and referring back to Maya Deren. And this is one of her praise songs. to pay attention to what people have to say about what they're doing. When the gods are there, she's totally away. A being away that we have no real idea of what that's like. Now we have some resonant experiences. We all have driven in a car and kind of daydreamed and all of a sudden we pull up to our house. That's a kind of a being way. But this kind is extreme. And I want to take her for what she says is happening. And how do the gods come? How do they come ride their mounts? And this is something we might discuss later. I'm not so much maybe inside of them. When a rider rides a horse, they don't get inside the horse, but on the skin. That's how I'm thinking of this. And who calls them? The drums, these sacred drums. These drums, however, are made out of chemical barrels. This was an innovation from the 1930s. But they're sacred. They've been given special medicine. They've been given the sacrament of the colonet. 
Libations are poured of them. They're given sacrifice. They're enlivened. They can call the gods to recover that long abused term that Professor Latori has written about elegantly. They're a fetish. They have agency. They're alive. They're dangerous and require special care and handling. But when they sound, they call the gods to play with their children. <laughs> traditions, they're based on very similar rhythmic practices that I don't have time to go into, I've written about extensively, kind of creating a cognitive flexibility, a multi-polyrhythmic formation that is conducive to being together. The gods are totally there. Virtuosos of embodiments, they're embodiments of virtuosity, of being there. And they are there the person who they ride, their devotee, is totally away, and everyone else is in between in a liminal space making music together. Now, to turn to the other side of the coin, very briefly, I want to talk a bit about my work on music torture, another extreme musical experience. And I'm going to do this through a brief history of Abu Zubaydah, the very first detainee in the global war on terror that was subjected to the full panoply of the euphemism enhanced interrogation techniques instituted by the George W. Bush uh, administration. The picture on the left is Abu, on your left is Abu Zubaydah in 1995, and the picture on your right is from 2006 when he was transferred to Guantanamo. Through a piece of synchronicity, a few days ago, the Guardian newspaper had a front page full spread on Abu Zubaydah, who they call the forever prisoner. He is still in Guantanamo. And we never found out what happened to his left eye. When he was there, he was subjected in Thailand. They brought in two psychologists to reverse engineer the SEER military program, survival, evasion, resistance, and escape, and enhance that with waterboarding. He himself called this the vortex, this combination, this multimodal approach. Sensory deprivation, and sensory overload in the form of extreme music being blasted at him, the 100 decibels over 20 to 22 hours a day, ambient temperatures manipulated to freezing, stripped naked, waterboarded 83 times in three months, put in a small three foot square box where music was blasted at him. He himself, and others talk about the fact that music was one of the worst forms of t torture. Why music? We think of music as entertainment, as uplifting our soul, etc. How could music be torture, even if it's music that you hate? And what they said was they couldn't mind wander. They couldn't daydream. They couldn't get away from the existential present. We normally are in a continual flux. Recent work in fMRI imaging suggests that 
we go through 90 minute cycles every day where we're more prone like REM sleep to mind wander. And what happened here is that music nailed them into a present. There's a lot of work I've been doing on entrainment. Mostly what was played, what was favorite of the tortures was death metal with something called blast beats, this very stiff rhythmic practice. African rhythmic practice is well ventilated. It has a lot of possibilities. Death metal offers none of those. We don't have video evidence of this, though videos were recorded of all the sessions because he was an experiment of learned helplessness, but the CIA destroyed all those tapes. What we do have are some powerful drawings by Abu Zubaydah of what happened to him. So I'll warn you, the next slide I'm going to show you is rather disturbing. Drawn by Abu Zubaydah, he is chained to the ceiling. Uh, air conditioning is shown that's down into the freezing rain, 42 degrees. He's being hosed down with a strong a blast of water and a boom box is blasting music at him, death metal. That sounds amazingly like an AR-15. <laughs> to conclude, if music is the herald of the future, as Jacques Attali claims in his book, Noise, a political political economy of music, then the weaponization of music portends a troubling future, one that we ignore at our own peril. Perhaps we need new ways of doing old things. Instead of listening to music through ever smaller acoustic devices that isolate us into our own private soundtrack for living, a kind of musical masturbation where we feel good and in interiority. Describing a skin encapsulated monad, we need to begin once again to start making music together as is still done in a wide swath of Africa. We need to embrace the gift of being together, of musical ways of being in the world. Music is that rare experience that has the potential to lead us into new rituals of becoming, thus belonging, of being with, of being musical. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. I'm honored to follow you. And thank you, Elian, for that kind introduction. I really appreciate that. It's been quite an honor to dialogue with you and with Evan for the past few weeks and learn new things about my own ideas and about your ideas as well. I'd also like to thank Ms. Yuchi and Ms. Cece for all their support this week. And thank you so much. Tell me your name. What is his name? John, your what's his last name? John E. John, John Donahue, thank you so much for your help, John. <laughs> Let's see, I'm supposed to turn this mic on so you'll hear me doubly well. I hope there's no echo. Is there an echo? Okay. Thank you so much. Now, I study primarily West African Yoruba religion, Brazilian Candomblé, Cuban Santeria Ocha, and Haitian Vodou. In addition, I study white people from an Afro-Atlantic perspective. My research and my adult life today 
are dominated by a contrast between two sonic images. The first is of a baby sleeping on the back of a woman, or even of my own daughter in the arms of a dancing Oshun amid a polyrhythmic chorus of drumming and song. Many African and Afro-Atlantic children grow up with a habitus of both sleep and consciousness that is trained by polyrhythmic drumming. The other sonic image at the center of my life, and I would argue of the nation, is of the young white male gunman in tactical gear stalking the corridors and classrooms of an elementary school. As his AR-15 calls out, the little children know to cower quietly in the corners, in the closet, or under the desks, and to hold still if they happen to fall under the protection of the body of another child fallen to a bullet. Each scenario dramatizes a historically specific phase in the sonic habitus of the host society. Like any such embodied social disposition or manner of interaction, any such habitus may be acquired during adulthood, but it may also be acquired, ingrained, or imprinted from infancy. Today, Stephen and I are one in the purpose of demonstrating some of the analytical tools that emerge from the study of personhood and consciousness implicit in Afro-Atlantic soundscapes, and applying them to the analysis of the current moment in US American life. Western epistemologists, such as René Descartes, to cite a foundational example, are preoccupied with interior states as the characteristic sites of consciousness. The principal methodological challenge for such philosophers is that while the philosopher has a high degree of access to their own interior states, they have, by postulate, no direct access to the interior states of other beings. The autonomous, self-governing mind inside the fortress of the individual self is a corollary to the ideal of freedom from hereditary social hierarchy and from human interdependency. According to one Haitian priest, and mentor of mine, as well as of my dear friend Liza McAllister's, Jean-Daniel Lafontan, he says this formula for human existence is a recipe for loneliness and suicide. John Chernoff memorably demonstrated that Eve and Dagomba drumming is a fruitful metaphor of African social relations generally. African drumming works according to what Richard Waterman calls a metronome sense. The coordinated relationship among the drum and dance rhythms is not audibly visible, or audible or visible from the start of the performance, but emerges by the end. During the performance, everyone must have an implicit sense of how their parts, albeit sometimes playfully, fit together with each other. Chernoff argues that such music is a method of socialization a socialization that assumes the co-presence of multiple conflicting forces in social life, and also demonstrates the mediation and balancing of these forces through often syncopated performance and through the playful dialogue between drummers and dancers. Are you with me? Thank you. I'm gonna check in with you periodically. Sometimes you, know, you get lost in your own disciplinary vocabulary and don't realize people aren't following you. So if you're with me, say yeah. If you're not, say, huh, come again? <laughs> All right. At a party or during a sacred festival, percussive music visibly coordinates, focuses, and transforms the social body, dramatizing the fact that consciousness resides not in the brain alone, but also in the ears, the eyes, the muscles, and in some, the habitus of human interaction. This socialized form of embodied consciousness in the context of rhythmic music might be described as a social consciousness. I am, of course, thinking of Durkheim's notion of the conscience collective, which includes collective representations, symbols, words, categories, a cosmology generally, as well as an esprit de corps, that too is a part of his conscience collective. That is the sense that uh, sometimes when an event focuses our lives, like a dance or a football game, we get so caught up in the excitement of it that we feel as though we're one body. I have this concept in mind, of course. But African ritual drumming demands that we think of social consciousness as a verb. 
It visibly displays the process of people actively thinking, feeling, and therefore moving together in conversation-like coordination because of a shared auditory experience. The involuntary corporal and emotional experience of music and the participant's physical, physiological response to it strongly undermine the post-enlightenment ontological premise that the mind is private and personal, as well as the ethical premise of bodily autonomy and mental privacy. Drumming ritual is closely associated with possession trance and with forms of inspiration that dramatize the fact that the individual is not the lone operator of the body. Spirit possession, which usually occurs in the midst of drumming and dance, and usually follows sharp breaks or disruptions in the rhythm, is a, more, is a morally exemplary lesson about the nature of ordinary society and consciousness as well. That is, we are all continually driven by multiple forces of which most people are not consciously aware, but we need to acknowledge and respect those forces. Are you with me? Now I'd like to explain what I call, for the lack of a better term, the ancestor theory of personhood and consciousness. About a dozen times a week, I think to myself, self, how would my mother deal with a situation like this? Or self, how would my father deal with a situation like this? What could I do to avoid the pitfalls characteristic of each approach and take advantage of the characteristics of each approach. Now, this is a minor instance of a bigger principle that my priests have taught me. The Afro-Atlantic cosmos began with a multifarious set of ancestors, each of whom embodies an aspect of the world, a set of places, a set of species, a set of atmospheric events, and a set of occupations and personality types. When manifest in their possession priests, each of these gods or spirits dresses in colors, carries scepters, wears jewelry, and dances in ways that reveal the aspect of the world that it embodies and apotheosizes. Each living person today is governed preeminently by a dominant subset of those ancestors whose personalities and motives often drive us without our being consciously aware of it. Polyrhythmic drumming and dance are the mother of all Afro-Atlantic techniques of social consciousness, its revelation, and its management. The forcible seizure of the medium by the ancestor and the dance dialogue between the god manifest in his or her medium and the mother drum dramatize an essentially social and hierarchical nature of social life, of consciousness, and their management. Possession trance or divine consciousness in the Afro-Atlantic religions is visualized as a dramatic temporary conjunction between a person and an entity that resembles a spouse, a wind, a burrowing beast, a horseman, or a partner in a master-slave relationship. However, these dramatic temporary states of divine consciousness reveal the nature of quotidian forms of consciousness as well. Thus, insofar as possession trance is the mostly public demonstrative lesson about the nature of consciousness, consciousness is not only normatively, is not normatively individual, private, or free, but social, public, and defined by hierarchical social solidarity. I'll talk to you more about hierarchy later if you're not getting the reference to the mother drum taking command of this transition in, in consciousness and a whole hierarchy of people, especially in the Yoruba Atlantic conflicts, who manage that, those transitions of consciousness. Now, with reference to the Haitian case, which is very, very rich in metaphors, the zombie is the Haitian antitype of the socially conscious person. The zombie is unconscious less as a function of lacking an individual mind or of being unfree than as a function of being alienated from his family and its spirits. Public ceremonial spirit possession highlights aspects of ordinary consciousness as well. First, even the non-priest is a vessel self, and that vessel self contains multiple beings. For example, Yoruba priests remind us that we have uri, which is the spirit of the head, but actually it dwells in the belly, 
near the navel, which connects you to your mother. We also have in our bodies ikmari. It's a spirit in the back of the head that protects us from dangers from coming behind. We're also occupied by a spirit called esse, which means literally leg or foot. It's the spirit that helps us progress in life as our ori makes plans for us. Not to mention a biome of kokoro, that is worms, bacteria, mitochondria, etc., that are all part of us. Each of us is a vessel self with many personalities within it. Second, most Yoruba feelings are constructed as subjects or agents of the feeling rather than as qualities or temperatures of the person who's doing the feeling. That is, for example, to say I'm hot, I say, I'll say, orumumi, heat is catching me. To say I'm sleepy, I say, orunkumi, sleepiness is filling me. Ebinkani, that means I'm hungry, that means literally hunger is killing me. And ongbengbeni, I'm thirsty, means thirst is drying me. So the feeling is the agent rather than a quality or a temperature. Some strong feelings about things and phenomena are described as possession by that thing or phenomenon. For example, if someone says to you, is it the fact that you're wealthy that's making you act in this pretentious way? Is money mounting you? Is beauty mounting you? Means, is it because you're pretty that you think you can act in that bad way? Moreover, according to Iyao Shun Shubo, my Nigerian Yoruba priestess, our deepest thoughts occur not in the brain, but in the abdomen, where we, were much con where we were once connected to our mothers. So in sum, consciousness is assumed typically to be social and a phenomenon that is shared with other people. That's a result of a conjunction with other people and coordination with other people. I should note that polyrhythmic drumming for multiple gods is not the only Afro-Atlantic soundscape that serves as a socializing metaphor or metonym of social consciousness facilitating the management of our multiple spirits. For example, in our Yon North, there also exists a rivalry between the sacred drumming for the Odisha and the call to prayer. There are loudspeakers all over the town now that broadcast the call to prayer five times a day directly into one's window. But if a drumming procession in celebration of Yemoja passes by the mosques, people will come out and say, stop that drumming. You're in front of the mosque. Respect the mosque. So there are rival soundscapes in the black Atlantic world. I should also note that drums are not the only sound producing tools that can orchestrate communication with the ancestors or the transfers of the body from one temporary captain to another. I brought show and tell as I always do. So, here, for example, is the bell that I use to call my Yemoja. This is the bell for my Oshun. I don't have a Cuban Oshun, but this is her bell. This is for my Rada Lua, my Lua of the Rada Nation. Ai Bobo, can I get an Ai Bobo? This is for my Petro spirits, the rebel slaves. This is for my Shango. This too is for the Petro spirits. The rebel slaves are driven by the whip. And that's for my white people who like it. Oh, I have to keep my Yemoja belt with me. I told you I was studying BDSM, right? <laughs> and I'm a participant observer. The leather whip is also used in the red and black societies of Haiti, like Champwell, about which uh, Professor McAllister lectured so elegantly yesterday. Now, um, I should add further that music is not alone among the sensory experiences that induce transformations of consciousness. For example, in Haitian voodoo and espiritismo of the Caribbean, smells are very important. 
So I brought just a sampling of the perfumes relished by the Radha spirits, the Pitwo spirits, and uh, the Agua Florida there. Almost all of the orichas of the Caribbean and the spirits of the dead love those perfumes. And all around the Afro-Atlantic religions of the Americas, the spirits love the smell of basil. Eucalyptus is really great to drive evil spirits away too. So smells too are important in these transitions. Now, by contrast to the Afro-Atlantic social consciousness, the ideal form of post-enlightenment thinking occurs in isolation from others and relies on the fiction that one can isolate investigation, contemplation, and knowledge from the social identity and social relationships of the thinker. Still with me? Okay. So it's no surprise that US American young people increasingly regard music production and music listening, as Professor Friedson noted, as lone enterprises, solitary enterprises. Yet my most newsworthy argument today is, shared with Professor Friedson, that the AR-15 is the focus of an emerging US American socializing soundscape, a soundscape that sonically nominates an order of social reality and endows it with a profound affect like the drums, the AR-15 is also a focus of ambivalence and controversy about how relationships within that reality should work. For this reason, in the US, the AR-15 has become the mother, or more appropriately, the monarch of guns and even the king of all sounds. I forgot to salute Eshu before I started. Eshu la roye. The AR-15 is perhaps the foremost revindication of personal autonomy and sovereignty by white men who feel so weak that only a gun that requires no skills will allow them to prevail over an unarmed black adult or even a classroom full of children. They take pride in miming the enlightened colonizer at the half-savage 19th century frontier, as well as a series of white male ancestors since the Oklahoma City bombing of 1980, 1995, excuse me, and the massacre at Columbine in 1999. One out of 20 US Americans owns an AR-15. Get that again, one out of 20. U.S. Americans owns an AR-15. The, plural, the plurality of them declaring that they anticipate using it in defense of their homes and families in the face of a pervasive threat from jihadists, black people, brown immigrants, women's liberation, trans rights, clean energy outsourcing, and a sense that the loss of several overseas wars means that white men have lost their edge over the rest of the world. The purchasers of AR-15s are indeed disproportionately older, non-college educated, ex-military, and suburban white men. The AR-15 AR is also the favorite gun of incels, who have abandoned all hope of becoming white patriarchs and are ready to destroy every human symbol of their failure. Users summarize that firing this gun is, in quotes, fun. They typically go to the firing range for this sort of entertainment. Others, pr others prefer to have their fun at elementary schools and at stores, beauty salons, and shopping malls where black, brown, and East Asian people gather. These mass murderers are conscious of the soundscape they are orchestrating. For example, a year and two days ago, an AR-15 wielding shooter murdered 10 black shoppers in a Buffalo supermarket because they are black. John? He mentioned that his firearms hurt his ears and that he came to suffer terrible headaches because of it. 
yet he wrote coolly and extensively about the earplugs and other hearing protections best suited for his upcoming and last mission. The AR-15 mur toting murderer of 21 at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, looked at a teacher and said to her, good night, before shooting her to death. A surviving child, an 11-year-old, heard him shoot an entire classroom full of children. Then she heard him play music. She said it was sad music and, in quotes, I want people to die music. The little girl is now traumatized by any kind of unexpected sound that resembles a melody. Thus, in the United States today, the AR-15 has become the sonic soundscape at the crux of contrasting dreams about the future of our national community. One is a vision of a democratic national community that values ethno-racial and religious diversity and equal justice for all. The other is the vision of the United States founded by white Christian men who therefore have the right either to govern us all on their own terms or to destroy the whole democratic system and create a Nietzschean paradise of their own where the strongest white men rule and the ones with the most AR-15s. At night, as I attend to my altars for the Odisha and the Loire, and I remember the relationships that they materialize. Sometimes another metallic so sound comes from afar and interrupts my social consciousness, reminding me of the rhythm of America today. Sometimes the Ogunni, Ogunjasi Jasi Patakori, he cries red-eyed tears when he thinks of the children at Columbine, Sandy Hook, Uvalde, and the south side of Chicago. He cries at the threat that the soundscape poses to my own children, my adult son and daughter. Of course, not all of these gunshots come from the AR-15. But just as polyrhythmic drumming and dance are the mother of techniques in the balancing of Afro-Atlantic social consciousness, the AR-15 is now the monarch of US American guns and the soundscape of a struggle over the fate of our nation. transformations of consciousness, um, we're talking about states of being, we're talking about what is a person, what is personhood, we're talking about objects, um, we're bringing all of these together. Um, and so I'd be curious to hear you talk about um, adornment, about embodiment, about the body, um, even about secrecy, opacity, you all uh, reference some of that, um, but really expand a little more on how you're framing. Hello. What I, uh, I've experienced in Africa, and to me, after 35 years of working with these rituals, that it's Africa's gift to the world, and we've yet to accept it. And I always had this feeling that uh, the people I worked with were kind of open in the back. They were not closed off from each other. Dr. Martori was talking about are connected in a really social way and that music is this incredible way of sharing time together, uh, what Alfred Schutz calls growing older together in durée, that we don't have in any other kind of form. And I don't think it's about communication, 
but an instant being together. And that's very different than my perception of the modern American male, for example, who seems to be this closed off, encapsulated, skin encapsulated monad, as I said, and not connected to uh, a reaching out, but a moving in. So one is an expansion out into uh, framing this within musical experience of, waiting to, of being together. The other is an isolating activity, which is implicated to me in music torture. Of that's what music torture is doing, is isolating someone down into kind of the perfected neoliberal subject. It's a problem, to say the least, and manifest this stuff you know, like Dr. Matori was talking about in the Sovereign Citizen and the symbol of the AR-15. We have congressmen now wearing that uh, on their lapels. That's how far this cult, and it is a cult, has gone. And that's very different than a church. And I'm thinking church here much more in the Durkheimian sense of a moral community tied together through practices around the sacred, which to me is exactly about music as ritual. Well said, Professor Friedson. Um, one further thing I'd wanted to say, but I already felt I'd said too much in a single, you know, supposedly 10 to 15 minute lecture, is that despite US Americans' very pronounced pursuit of independence and self-sufficiency, uh, we also have the same longings as other human beings. Um, people still go crazy at concerts. <laughs> they tear off their bras, throw themselves on the stage, crowd surf, and tens of millions of us stayed up late at night to watch the royal coronation and to watch, watch the royal weddings uh, as though there is a uh, profound longing, longing in the midst of our uh, official pursuit of independence individuality, self-sufficiency, and equality for hereditary forms of hierarchy and boundness to other people. Um, longings that are also manifest in BDSM in which it is typically the most prosperous, uh, high-ranking, and self-sufficient people who in the dungeon long to be slaves and subs. So uh, one of the impulses to Western personhood toward individual, individuality, self-sufficiency, equality with all other white people, and closedness so that one's not dependent on or penetrated by anybody else, actually has the equal and opposite reaction, which is an Afro-Atlantic priest would say, of course. <laughs> Thank you all. So one more thing that uh, came up for me in both of your talks was this, uh, the language of, of temperature, specifically heating and cooling. And so I, I'm really wondering what kind of affordances um, ritual uh, lend to us when thinking about the hot and the cool, when thinking about um, ritual technology, what kind of affordances ritual technologies provide us with. Um, and what is the part played by ritual technologies or any idea of ritual technologies um, in revealing the world um, and the materiality of sound? Heat and cool are central symbols in the Afro-Atlantic religions, and different traditions often have opposite emphases. Like Yoruba tradition is typically, West African Yoruba tradition is typically about cooling down everything. Cool it down as much as you can, whenever you can. To the same degree, Haitian tradition centralizes heating things up, and that whip is for the purpose of heating up the enslaved spirits who are central to everything. Even the royal spirits need the heat of the revolutionary slaves to empower the paquet Congo and ritual postices and, and medicines. Um, in Yoruba tradition as well, I don't want to oversimplify, you know, whenever you say any, offer any generalization about, about any of these traditions, one has to say the opposite because that's the nature of spirit. You know, I was talking last night about the fact that, you know, the, the, the God who rules your head doesn't make it easy for you to predict from your personality which God that is. That is to say, you know, Abatala is supposed to be cool and wise and balanced and creative, 
But the reason he's that is he's struggling against alcoholism. And whenever he touches alcohol, he goes mad. So there are opposite tendencies within any given spirit or person. Um, so in, within Yoruba tradition, there are typically hot gods who are typically male, who are considered violent and destructive, and female gods typically who tend to be regarded as, as calm and fertile and, and, and productive of, uh, of good things. Uh, but any given god also has a side that's opposite him or herself. Any goddess has a male side, any cool god, cool goddess has a female side, and so forth. So the complementarity between the two and the balance between the two, I think, is the ultimate principle of most of these religions. Uh, John Chernoff talks about to play hot rhythms in this Dagomba tradition, you have to be cool. He talks about having to have a cat's paw and a hand. So to be hot, to create hot music, you have to be cool to do it. Once again, this kind of balance. But in Ghana, too, they talk about hot deaths and cool deaths. So cool deaths, you die in your sleep in your bed. That's the way you want to go. Hot death is any kind of accident or unforeseen circumstances. And those hot spirits have special places. For example, in the Gorvodu I worked in, too, there's a place called the desert, Jogba, where those hot spirits go, and only special people can go there. And just like you said, there's this kind of balance and combination. Chariya, the mother god, is supposed to be able to cool down Kunde, the father, but she's also the most dangerous because if you cross her, she'll kill you in an instant. And she was part of witchcraft um, movements in the form of Abluwap and Kamasi region. So this cool and hot, it's, it made it to us, right? We, hot jazz, hot music. Where did we get the idea that energy and that music can be hot? And finally about the technology. We have, we think of technology uh, today as standing reserve of things that are there to be used up. Um, the mountain range is no longer a mountain range, it's to be mined, the river is to be hydroelectric power. And that's the way we kind of approach it. And African music as a technology, it's a techne, back to the Greek word techne, and that's something that reveals a world, the world of the spirits, and that's the power of music in here, and the technology of it. And I should, I should correct something that I said before which was a little bit too much on the hot side. Um, nobody in BDSM actually hits somebody with a bullwhip. They, it's, you use it to make the sound because the, the bullwhip can just tear flesh off people. So you, you perform heat, but you make sure the, 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 the stinger doesn't really hit the person. So you have to be hot and cold. Thank you. I'd really like to open up uh, the Q&A for everyone who has questions. Um, obviously, I have more questions, but <laughs> I assume that you all have a lot of questions, too. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for such a rich, depressing, and uplifting uh, <laughs> set of comments. I just wanted to add that, of course, the cuisine of the Afro-Atlantic world is hot and cold, often with a base of cornmeal that's cool, let's say, in a sauce of hot fish, a yes, smaller amount. Right. And I was at a conference at Harvard where we were talking about dance, and this young woman said that her family will dance in the kitchen, and when they get, you know, after dinner or before dinner, and when they get all heated up and they start dancing really quickly, someone will yell, sauce! Uh. So, you know, dance is hot and cool, food is hot and cool, and I love that image of this family yelling out, sauce, when someone was really hot in their uh. dance. That was obviously a comment and not a question. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I learned so much. I, I have a kind of a methodological question. Um, and Professor Matori, you mentioned the limitation or the, uh, the methodological, met, method, methodological challenge of people like uh, Rene Descartes, who privileged inter interiority as, as sort of the side of consciousness and the problem that we can't get inside someone else's mind. Um, and I often find, um, certainly from an ethnomusicological standpoint, it's, it's very hard um, 
to write about religion and spirituality and transformations of consciousness because we're faced with the, the challenge, the methodological challenge. Well, how do you really know uh, how the spirits are acting on someone else? We can see the embodied sort of after effects or the, I guess the, not really after effects, but the, the manifestations of, of what people say are spirit. But I can also imagine, you know, a critical perspectives that say, come on, how do you all really, how can you speak of such things as though they are fact? We are, we are academics, we are scholars. Um, and even if you yourself are a practitioner and a believer in these traditions, um, and, uh, how do you, how do you uh, translate this in a way um, that gets out of your own experiences in your own, your own mind? I hope that makes sense. Of course. You want to have a thought up there? Well, I would say musical experience is part of that, is one of the great things about ethnomusicology is being able to participate in music making and I think that is a privileged place of opening oneself up to experience. So of course, you know, we can't possess other people's minds or get inside other people, as Gertz said, that's its own f kind of form of possession. But, you know, from Gertz, it's kind of low flying theory is what he would talk about on the ground. And in, being in a temple in Malawi in the middle of the bush, you know, at three o'clock in the morning and drumming is just wailing away and you haven't slept in three weeks, except for cat naps, you start to get resonant experiences. Not the same experience, let's say, but a resonant experiences that allows a certain affordance of moving into ritual situations in meaningful ways instead of standing back from it and becoming an observer and that whole thing. I mean, I think somebody invoked Michael uh, Jackson yesterday in radical empiricism, Alan Roberts. And I think that's an approach to take of radically looking at what's happening in front of you and listening to what is in front of you is uh, one way into that. The Western adolescent that's still in me is still willing to entertain the possibility that you all out there are just an illusion and a figment of my imagination. I don't have any proof to the contrary. On the other hand, it's equally plausible to believe that it's a fiction, that I'm a self-sufficient subject and observer. I've never been a self-sufficient person. I was brought up by a mother. There's never been a time in my life when I wasn't depend on, dependent on somebody else and wasn't affected by the gaze of someone else or the scowl of someone else or you know, the way that you all moved and tensed up at times during my talk. There's, there's never been a time in my life when other people's reactions and other people's deeds weren't part of my mind. So it's equally empirical to assume that the things happening between us are the reality and that some fiction that there's something interior and beyond perception and, and self-existent, even in oneself, is a fiction. You get me? So that, that, I mean, maybe it's not sufficient to convince the adolescent Western teenager in me, but I mean, to me, the empirical reality is consciousness is between people. We see it every day. I've never been conscious without other people. Even my deepest thoughts are in words that I learned from other people. My English language didn't come from my interior. The Yoruba I, language or French or anything like that. So. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, thinking of consciousness as just this talking voice in our head as its own kind of being possessed by our ego, which I think is a neoliberal disease almost. And even going back, I see people at concerts and I think great people are together and they've all got their phones and they're either, you know, experiencing that through their phones or they're pointing them at themselves. And I often get the feeling they've just transferred this habitus of an interior listening to the concert stage and in a concert setting and it just amplifies this kind of musical masturbation that's going on. And the gunman shows up at the concert too. Remember Las y Vegas? Yep. Yeah, that was the largest loss of life, I think, was the Las Vegas one. Okay. 
I wanted to ask around, um, jazz keeps coming up as, as, we're, as you were both were sharing, both around the individualism versus the collective. And then um, you mentioned something around uh, the, there's the, the, the medium and then the folks who are making the music are kind of in between. In that in between state, they must be present to play the music because it's not memorized. It's all, that's what I love about a jam, right? So I wanted to just like um, ask around that and how the, that idea evolved black American music as not just an art form, but also as like a way of healing and processing this, this grief and pain that we endure every day. I don't know if I heard all. Oh. It's, uh, it was 10 years on the road playing rock and roll. So oh, she, she, We referred to jazz multiple times. Mm. And she was referring to the, asking about the role of the audience and uh, that has to be present. And uh, the, the use of, of jazz, which I, get, I guess you're highlighting the aspect of it that entails improvisation and audience performer interaction as uh, as a technology of healing mm. from the, from trauma, and um, yeah, yeah. So this is this is a meaningful question to me, especially because of my ignorance. I'm a funk guy. I'm not a jazz guy. That consistent four four beat is what drove my adolescence, and I just go crazy when I hear Parliament Funkadelic. Um, when I when I hear jazz and the improvisation that you know really is a continual you know call call and response between the saxophonist and the audience going, yeah, you know, that's the, to me that demonstrates the, the point of social consciousness, much as the interaction between the mother drum and the, and the dancer does in, uh, in, Ghan, in, in Ghanaian drumming, and uh, Professor Friedson knows more about Southern African drumming. But uh, yeah, jazz to me is, is very much like that polyrhythmic rhythmic drumming uh, thing and I think metronome sense applies to the analysis of jazz too. So they don't all start on the same beat, but you know people just come in and they're all talking to each other and improvising, and each one has a chance to solo and and eventually you know at some point they're in a groove and the leader of the group will will you know somehow give an eye gesture or something that tells them all at the same time stop at that instant and it all comes together. So I think jazz is very much like the polyrhythmic drumming that we're thinking of, and very different from that you know, highly Africanized, but very Western, kind of regimented, militarized kind of dance that I did. But that stuff sent me, too. That, is, yeah. that stuff inspired me, too. Let's see if I can formulate my thoughts. Um, it's, it, I'm, what do we do about those guns? So, and what do we mean by consciousness? So here we are, uh, and we're all nodding our heads and we're deeply moved by the depth of experience that you both share, that we resonate with. And then we're in front of the fact that we're in a very sick world, certainly a sick nation. It's a bit overwhelming. Yeah. And I'm wondering about response. So for me, the way I formulate my response is through ethnography. And I think that's one thing that anthropologists and other ethnographers, ethnomusicologists, people who do Who's, who spend time in communities that are not their own, learn to be, to hang out with their own discomfort. You know, to linger in discomfort. And if we don't learn how to do that, I think we're lost. And so, you know, there, there's, there's the dance, there's the beat, there's the rhythm, all of that is healing. That's a healing response, that's what we need. But in a sense, you're preaching to the converted here. And even those who 
know that. When do I get to dance as a 65-year-old woman, right? I do it in my living room and often alone, right? So, so that's, that's just a silly anecdote, but it's also a symptom. It's a symptom of, of this very uh, bizarre moment in history where we don't know how to reach the other. And when we do, we reach out to those like ourselves who understand each other and we can nod our heads and go back to our rooms and say, yeah. But it's not yeah. <laughs> because the people we need to reach are precisely those that we don't know, understand. And so anyway, I, I can go on. but. For me, you know, multilingualism is important. Learning to live with your own discomfort and teaching our children because you know what? At this level, as grown-ups, we're formed, we're formed, right? But it's the little kids that need to learn this. It's those little ones that need to learn this, you know? So I think that sometimes the, the activism, you know, here we are in this very august institution but really, we need to be working with the little kids that are suffering the most from the sickness of, of this world. I don't know if you have any response to that. Yeah. You know, it's just to put a point on that, it, Michael Bull talks about accompanied solitude, that even when we're in a group, we are by ourselves in many ways. Uh, he talks about Walkman culture and that kind of stuff. And you know, that's what I was saying, maybe we gotta try to figure out to make music more together, not listen to it, but actually figure out a way to play it. But I don't know how to do that. I'm not sure how that works. So. I have two responses, oh, have you finished? Yeah, go ahead. I have two responses. Um, one is that I think you're speaking very much in the spirit of the kind of music we're talking about. As I, uh, if, if Dr. Chernoff is correct, the whole premise behind Dagwamba and Eve drumming, and perhaps this is generalizable in Sub-Saharan African music, and people always dispute, they'll come up with counterexamples, but the assumption behind polyrhythmic music, according to Chernoff, is that society is made up of conflicting parties. Society is made up of people with different rhythms. The point is to understand those other rhythms and know how to interact with them. You know, even, you know, we, we speak of an, an entity called witches in the West, and you'd never call them that in Yul Balan. You would not insult them with that word. They're called our mothers. Very powerful women. They can kill you if they want to. They're touchy. You better not say anything bad about them. But the chiefs and the kings bring them together, literally talk to them at night and say, you know, how do we resolve the conflicts in the community? And you'll notice a lot of Yoruba crowns have circles of birds around them. They represent our mothers. The purpose of, of the monarch is not to uh, eliminate conflict, just as we can't eliminate bacteria from our body. The point is to keep things in balance. And by contrast, you know, there's a certain um, moralistic idealism that besets, you know, radical members of the Abrahamic faiths and liberals alike, that everything has to be right. There has to be one set of rules that ought to govern everybody and everybody has to act alike and then we'll have harmony. But then in the pursuit of that goal, they're willing to kill people. It's a very un-African sensibility, typically. Now, in the spirit of ethnography, which I think shares something in common with polyrhythmic drumming. We understand there are different cultures in the world and some things that we think are normal, they're gonna think is, are abnormal. And the point is to go and you know, uh, try it out for a while. <laughs> you know, to live with them, see what it's like, see what the world looks like from their point of view and why they think it's a reasonable thing to do. You don't have to agree ultimately, but you need to understand if we're gonna live together in the world, which we're gonna be doing for a long time without agreeing with each other. So in that spirit, I've reached out to a lot of white conservatives. You know, I, I talk to them online, I meet them in the shops, and I talk to them, I hear their vision of the world, I can quote it back to you chapter and verse, much of what they've said to me. And, uh, you know, but with the people I've been closest to, like when a college roommate of mine became a Trumpite, the relationship just broke down. There was no more 
that love that I felt for him is, is just, it's gone. So there's only so far I can go to be friendly and loving to someone whose premise is that they have a greater right to life, happiness, and the pursuit of liberty because they're a white Christian than I do or my Jewish or Muslim friends do. There's some ways I'm just never gonna get along with them. Um, and if, if they think that they have the right to control this whole country, uh, regardless of the preferences of the rest of us, uh, it, it, there's just gonna be war. There's nothing I can do to compromise with them. Yeah. Take two more questions, so we'll go here and then here, and then that's it. Thank you for this amazing talk. Um, Dr. Mattery, I'd like to ask um, if you could speak on um, you, your new book that's, that you're working on and how BDSM plays a part in this conversation or in relationship to African diaspora religions. I had, I had not known anything about BDSM or the possibility that some people like being subordinated and humiliated and that some people like having strong sensations inflicted upon them because I don't like pain. And I'm a third child. I don't like being subordinated to anybody. But I was out at Ohio State University and my wife and I were there to discuss with a group of scholars there my last manuscript, The Fetish Revisited, which is about you know, Marxian and Freudian theories of the fetish and and the truth about the consecrated objects that I take very seriously. And then we walked down North High Street and at the edge of the black neighborhood, we ran into the shop called The Chamber, Ohio's largest fetish store. And we decided to go in out of curiosity and then we walk in the shop, first thing we see is black leather every place. And a woman told us, she was a femdom, she said she has this white Dutch man who's her slave and she showed us a picture. And the picture, the sign said, in the picture, he held up a sign that said, it's good to be a slave. So, you know, for me, the first moment I saw this, I said, this is a mimesis of slavery. This is white people using the history of Afro-Atlantic slavery to heal themselves. This is mostly white people who are slaves. They love the idea of having a black master or white woman master, like those masters of Wall Street, the masters of the universe on Wall Street, a lot of them go off on their lunch breaks to get beaten by black or Asian women, white women too. They like it. And so in any case, I think in sum that BDSM is, employs the metaphor of, of racialized slavery uh, to induce forms of healing in white people and it produces forms of trance that um, in some ways remind me of Afro-Atlantic systems of trance. And in my encounters with black BDSM practitioners and even when, when I go to venues where there are other practitioners of Afro-Atlantic religions, and I, you know, I worked up the courage to start asking people in priestly communities, hey, do you know anything about BDSM? And in both venues, people came out of the woods, people who practice both. I know a lot of people now practice both. And, and so um, I think in a way of BDSM as an Afro-Atlantic religion that, you know, like, Umbanda is made for white people. Last question. Good morning, and Good morning. thank you for all that you shared. Um, as the conversation traveled, um, and, and more recently, uh, ending with what you just shared, the, the word that's coming to my mind is submission. Um, but there's also the question of ethics behind what I'm interrogating right now. So it's the use of technology and it's also about the indwelling of the spirit is what I'm hearing. Um, Donald Lawrence came to this school, gospel composer came to the school, I don't think it was maybe last year this time. And one of the things that he shared is an interest in frequencies, you know, the science behind music and that he intentionally, um, you know, one of the things that's taught is that the tuning is to 440. And it's supposedly up-tuned from 432, which was a calmer state. And so going into 440, what Donald Lawrence shared was that around the time that it went into 440, there was this notice of crowd surfing. Folks were becoming very energetic. 
Um, so my question or, or my thought right now is about intentional use of music as a technology, uh, understanding that there's a submission that is necessary for the indwelling of, I'm a practicing Christian after much journey um, to the Holy Spirit or whatever the spirit is, but as a practicing Christian, I say the Holy Spirit. But I question, right, because I also have the experience for three decades of my life of working with ensembles, and this was to the, the question that you posed of like, how do we get at this, and how is it applicable? And so one of the things that I saw as an ensemble coach is that there's a necessary submission to the highest good. But there has to be an agreement on what the highest good is. So it comes out sounding harmonious, it comes out sounding like blend. Um, but connecting this to Donna Lawrence is the intentional use of creating music as prescription to tend to the human soul. So that with that, we can then see necessary shifts in the hearts. I appreciate the fact that you say that you're having conversations with you know, folks, quote unquote, on the other side, which is what I think is necessary. So if we can touch the hearts and not be offended as individual spirits, because we all wanna vibrate. We all, as a Christian, what we're taught is, well, I'm not gonna say everybody, what I've heard is uh, we were made to worship. There's this inclination in the human spirit to worship, to be, uh, to tune into, I'm gonna say again, the Holy Ghost of that highest spirit. And so how do we ethically, because it's about measurements, you know, how do we discern that the spirit is real or not? It's about our ability to measure and the, and the tools that we use, which tend to be more Western European. So how do we get to a place where we, ha place where we have like a uh, unified understanding of what is good? and then use the technology of music to because we have to agree with that and so it's about the ethic use of getting there and then without it being hypnosis um and without it being you know like uh, an imposition on someone else's spirit so i welcome your thoughts in any of that well i think music is the gift so thank you for talking about that of uh, this way of being together and, and there's been work on entrainment, for example, of um, pulling people together and you almost don't have a choice in that, of coming together in that kind of technology. Um, I think I had a lot more to say, but I just left my mind <laughs> into somewhere else. Um, yeah. Well, the, the child of the Enlightenment in me and the child of, uh, of a black Christian in me thinks that goodness lies, number one, in loving others as you love yourself, and number two, applying the same rules to everybody. I think that that's just basic, but that, that's only one me. The part of me that's trained by the Afro-Atlantic priests acknowledges that the world is really complicated and good isn't always clear. What is clear is power. And you need power to protect your people. Um, you need to be able to work with the right and the left. Um, you need to be aware that there are powerful people out there who mean you harm, and you have to figure out how to dance around them, how to move away from them, how to placate them. And, and the, the big principle is don't fight. Let's, you know, let's calm things down and let's, let's dance together. So you know, again, very much in the spirit of the Afro-Atlantic religions, I don't want to idealize our religions or you know, black, you know, the, you know, the highly moral black Christianity. Not all Christianity is fair because these, these white Christians I've been talking to, really they talk more like nationalists. You know, whatever, they don't, they don't really believe in right or wrong. They believe in their ownership of this country and they would do anything, cheat at elections, kill people, miscount votes. They would, they would do anything to preserve the principle that as white Christians, they're the owners of the land. So I'm, I'm just pointing out that the, the, the Afro-Atlantic frame that we're talking about, the ones that work with these transformations of consciousness, I think the larger ethic is the world is an unequal place with unequal power, 
and you can't count on everybody agreeing with you about what's right. That's just not gonna happen. So there are certain compromises that you make with power in the service of peace. And some people seek healing through submitting themselves to slavery. I mean, you, you invoke submission as a good thing. That's not the kind of thing I would want to be required of me. I don't want to submit to anybody, but that's the, that's the, you know, the adolescent Western sovereign citizen in me too. I have all these spirits in my head. I can articulate their points of view and I'm, I, my, my, my sadness or my uh, realism is that we're not gonna all agree. And we kind of have to make a decision about whether we need a single set of principles that we can all agree on which we can aspire to, we can try to force our beliefs down other people's throats, we can bomb them till they accept our version of democracy, but they might never fully accept it. <laughs> or we can accept the fact that human beings are always going to be diverse, conflict is natural, not even the family is some haven and paradise of everybody getting along, and if we stopped assuming it would be, we wouldn't be disappointed anymore. We could instead just deal with the fact that there's power, there's inequality, and there's conflict. And how do you dance with it? I would just add, you know, coming together in music, I think music is one of the few places you can't lie. If you consent and submit to playing music, you are doing it. You are part of that. So in the groups, uh, the shrines I worked with in Africa, the moral discourse was pretty straightforward. As I was saying at the beginning of my talk, anything that enhances life is good, and anything that diminishes life is evil in that discourse. And of course, some Africans diminish other people's lives to better their lives. That's what happened in the slave trade yeah. for centuries. Which was evil. I mean, not to them. I mean, not to the people who sold the slaves. I mean, it's the moral doubts about slavery are rare in Africa. So that you know that when everybody, I mean, some of you will know, when West African, I mean, when African Americans go to those slave forts in West Africa from Senegal to especially in Ghana, I, I thought I was going to be totally rational. I took a like, tour of Harvard alumni to, uh, to Gore Island, and I was taking them there, and I was going to lecture, and I was going to explain the history of the place, and I was going to be all rational, and all of a sudden I started going. <laughs> 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 but most. Most Ghanaians and Senegalese are not torn up about slavery. Those places have been places of government, they've been places of sales, they've been places generating prosperity, uh, all sorts of good things at the expense of other people. And, and so, I mean, I, yeah. It's a good corrective. Th thank you both. We'll have to continue these conversations throughout the day. Well, it's so good talking with you.